former San Francisco District Attorney Chase Boudin joins me now. He's currently executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley Law. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I mentioned the rising crime in the year since Brooke Jenkins replaced you as San Francisco DA. During the recall, she was attacking you over crime rates. I mentioned her quote, crime rate is directly linked to his failed policy, she said. Even if today she says they don't tell the whole story, what do you make of what's happened to crime rates, and especially violent crime, on her watch? Well, thank you for having me on. And the first thing to remember is that when we have conversations about data and policy, there are real lives, real people, uh, real victims, real people accused of crimes that are caught up in this. And all of those statistics have many human beings behind them. Yes. So it's critical to remember that, um, you know, I, I think we all do when we do this work, that we're dealing with real human beings and real lives and real tragedies. Um, that being said, I think we should hold Jenkins to her own standard. Uh, if she believed that crime rates are a direct result of DA policies, then I think we should question her policies and the rise in crime under them. Um, the reality, though, is that district attorneys are largely powerless in the short term to shape crime trends. And the progressive prosecutor movement, the criminal justice reform movement, is a movement based on a recognition that tough talking prosecutors are failing to keep our communities safe. In fact, and of course, Fox News does not want to show its viewers this, but pro-Trump counties in California and pro-Trump jurisdictions across the country have some of the highest crime rates and have some of the fastest rising violent crime rates anywhere in the country or in the state of California. But they choose, as you pointed out a moment ago, to attack progressives, people who are committed to thinking outside the box about reforms to our criminal legal system that can make us safer and make our system more just. It's been over a year since you were recalled from office by voters in that election. Looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, what do you think you got most wrong? What's your biggest regret? What would you do differently if you could go back and do it all again? You know, I learned an awful lot during my time in office. It was a very steep learning curve. It was a humbling opportunity of a lifetime to serve the people of San Francisco. And uh, certainly the COVID pandemic shutting down our office and our courthouse just two months into my tenure uh, was something we never could have predicted and that inevitably led to strategic mistakes um, that I wish we could have avoided. Uh, but I think one of the biggest lessons I learned was how big the disconnect is between what Fox News and other even liberal mainstream media outlets are showing voters and, and in turn how voters feel about public safety and what the data and evidence-based practices show on the ground. Um, I made the mistake, I think, throughout uh, the early time I was in office, of pointing to data, of showing police statistics that indicated crime was down and that our charging rates and conviction rates were actually up. It, it turned out that voters who were feeling say, uh, unsafe didn't want to hear about that data. They wanted someone in the office of the district attorney to hear them. And yeah. I obviously needed to do a better job doing that from, from day one. Their feelings didn't care about your facts, uh, to coin a phrase. I would ask you then, what do you do about that? How do you message your way around people's feelings if you've got data showing otherwise? Joe Biden is having a similar problem with the economy, where all the economic indicators are heading in the right direction, but people keep saying he's doing a bad job on the economy. How do you, as an elected official, get through to people when you've got the Fox machine, even parts of the liberal media, and people's feelings there? And also, let's be honest, Visually, people are walking around San Francisco saying, this is not what my city used to look like. Absolutely. And the pandemic led to all kinds of changes in how our day-to-day -day life felt and functioned. Uh, changes that the pro-recall forces and the Fox News uh, police union apologists did an excellent job exploiting to fan the fears of flames, even as London Breed was calling for defunding the police and then turning around and criticizing criminal justice reform when police brought the DA's office a historically low number of arrests. So the contradictions, the hypocrisy, the inconsistencies abound. And yet, to the heart of your question, I think it's critical that we not ask or expect elected officials to be the tip of the spear in educating voters in the face of a, a steamroller of mis- and disinformation. Instead, I believe, and this is a lesson I learned the hard way, that elected officials really have to meet voters where they're at start with their feelings, make them heard, and allow other folks at universities, like my new job as the founding executive director 
of Berkeley Law School's Criminal Law and Justice Center, uh, academics and scholars and civic leaders to do the role of persuading people of the facts, of showing them what the data actually shows, uh, of helping people's feelings catch up with what the evidence is. If we ask elected officials to do it, I think often we're asking them to walk off a plank. During the recall election, you often argued that this was a Republican-led attack on your progressive positions, but there were also high-profile Democrats breaking with you. You mentioned London Breed a moment ago. We just showed a clip of the mayor saying she wasn't on the same page as you and that you were effectively pro-criminal. Uh, why do you think that was, and how much responsibility do you think she had for the actual housing issues, homelessness issues, uh, street issues, quote-unquote, that were often laid at your door? Let's be crystal clear about one thing. It is not and should not be the responsibility of district attorneys in San Francisco or anywhere else in this country to solve problems of public health or public housing or education or any of the upstream issues that we know are critical driving forces behind crime and behind the perception of safety or lack thereof. That is the responsibility of mayors, of boards of supervisors, of city councils. But I became, and criminal justice across the country has become a very convenient scapegoat for those forces, whether Republican or simply aligned with corporate Democratic interests, to attack, to scapegoat, in order to absolve themselves of responsibility. London Breed and her ilk have had many, many years in power to address things like homelessness in San Francisco, to address things like the devastating toll of fatal overdoses on our streets. And, and, and let's look at the results of her appointments and her policies. Uh, her chosen, hand-chosen district attorney has relaunched a war on drugs with obvious and predictable results. This year, we've seen more than a 40 percent increase in fatal overdoses in San Francisco. That is directly attributable to the relaunching of the war on drugs and the decision, the intentional, explicit decision to defund treatment programs that we know save lives and reverse so, overdoses. It's so you mentioned the word defund. Let's talk about you know, in another context. Where are the Democrats nationally, do you think, on the issue of crime and policing and criminal justice reform? How do you think President Biden has handled these issues, especially given his own infamously tough on crime political background? Well, I think he was wise to stay out of the debate around uh, defund the police or not. I mean, look, L London Breed, the mayor in San Francisco, leaned in to defund the police. Um, and uh, folks assumed that I was the one saying that. And, and let me be clear, I, I believe that we are, are uh, required as elected officials to invest tax dollars in the most efficient way possible. And when it comes to tax dollars directed at public safety, I do think there's lots of room for improvement, for increasing efficiency, for more effectively addressing root causes of crime, for putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to victim services and victims' rights. There's a huge amount of room for improvement in those areas and for increasing efficiency of policing. But I wasn't going to stand up and say we should defund the police. That was what Mayor Breed and her hand chosen chief of police, Chief Scott, said over and over again on TV. And then when the polls changed directions, yeah. so did yeah. they. And I think that what we really need, uh, whether it be from San Francisco officials or across the country, is we need more consistency. What we're seeing instead is a ping pong approach to policy where uh, officials like the mayor of San Francisco aren't leading with conviction or with integrity or with evidence based strategies, but rather simply trying to chase headlines. And the result is catastrophic. We end up with rising crime, with increased fear. We end up with um, the inability to implement long-term strategic planning, which is critical if we're going to tackle the kinds of problems that not only San Francisco, but cities across the country are confronting. How do you respond to someone like Elon Musk, who has this huge megaphone, richest man or second richest man or whatever he is in the world? He's called your city post-apocalyptic because of all the retail stores that claim to be leaving downtown. He's compared it to The Walking Dead. He said it's a dying city. What do you say to his comments about the state of San Francisco and crime in SF? Well, uh, Elon Musk, like so many billionaires, is just woefully disconnected from day-to-day -day reality. And he may be very smart when it comes to technology, but he doesn't know the first thing about public policy or government or certainly criminal justice uh, policy. And so it, it's always a little disappointing to see people who really have no expertise, no background in the area, weigh in as though they're experts. Uh, you know, it, imagine if I took to Twitter and started uh, pontificating about uh, artificial intelligence or venture capital investment strategies. It's simply not 
my lane. And uh, I'm happy to read about it and learn about it. And, and Musk should do the same thing before he weighs in on these public policy issues. Given the status of Twitter right now, or X.com, you could probably do a better job pontificating on the future of that platform than the current owner. Uh, last quick question for you. You're on this, you know, you're running, you've got this new gig at Berkeley, running this new center, but you are on this show talking to me about politics. Do you have any plans to run for office again? You know, I am absolutely thrilled to be at Berkeley Law School, surrounded by some of the smartest legal minds in the country, doing deep thinking about policy, about practice, about educating the next generation of legal advocates and judges. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of work to do exactly where I am on the long-term policy work that is so desperately needed in, in elevating the nuance in the conversation in the public square that sadly, thanks to Twitter or X, is, is really missing in public conversations about things like public safety, about criminal justice. And so I couldn't be more excited uh, to be where I am at Berkeley Law School, to be working with uh, the premier scholars and students in the country, and to have a, a platform to do work on the long-term um, policy fixes that I know will make our community safer, that are the, uh, really the center and the, and the crux of the criminal justice reform movement, prioritizing violent crimes prosecuting those more effectively, so, uh, targeting... Uh, so so should causes. I take that as a yes or a no? It's a very politician answer. It was a very simple question. Do you have plans to run for elected office again? Say never. Never say never. And you are surrounded by some great legal minds at Berkeley, but you've also got John Yu. Uh, Chaser Boudin, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.